so you guys just make sure you guys can hear me. Like, let me hear your your honk this morning. This Pastor David, I'm so sorry that I started that. John, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to deal with that today. But we're so glad you guys are here. I want to share this passage from Hebrews 10. And we've been hearing it a lot lately. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking assembling together as some are in the manner of doing, but exhorting one another. And so much more as we see the day approaching. The church is alive and well, amen. But now, even over this weekend, I'm seeing so many different things happen in our communities. I just want to encourage us how it is so important for us to consider what the Lord 
understand the news that we experience in our community, even what had happened yesterday in our city. We know that God is moving. We know He is the one who will still work miracles and still work all things together for the good of those who believe and are called according to His purposes. Amen. wherever we are, let's just ask God's blessing for his presence to be in this drive-in service as we just worship, as Pastor Brian has led us into worship the Lord together. And this is a testimony that the church can worship anywhere. The church can praise God anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's a building, it doesn't matter if it's a parking lot, it doesn't matter if we have to go in the fields over there. We're going to worship God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for using us. God, in a moment where we need you most, in a time that you need to step in, 
it seems as if the world is going into chaos. Lord, I pray that our the church that we would humble ourselves and ask God to bless us, to heal our land. Nothing we can do, nothing we can try to exert some kind of physical force will give us peace. But we know the Prince of Peace. We know that Jesus has all the answers. We know Jesus can provide a peace and comfort that no one can ever provide. And Lord, we're asking you now, as a church family, that you would forgive us of our sins. That you would help us as Christians to help one another, to love one another in this dark world. That we would be a source of encouragement. But as Christians, we would be a source of love for other people to show that there is love in this world, there is peace in this world, and it's not through violence and evil, it's not through anything that we can actually muster ourselves, but it's of God. And we call upon your Holy Spirit today. We call upon the Spirit that can do all things, that can manifest God in us, that it could do great and mighty works through us by the Holy Spirit. We're asking for this blessing over the service, God. We're we're asking and seeking that you would bless us during this drive-in service. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I just wanted to spend a few minutes today before Brother John comes and preaches to us. If you see the stage kind of shaking and the canopy shaking, pray for us. It's pretty windy up here. But we will still go on praying that we don't get blown away. But I wanted to just to talk about a few things today, about some of the things going on in our world, and actually today it's the day of Pentecost. I think that it's no coincidence that today is the day of Pentecost. With everything in our world that's going as it is, it's kind of interesting that God would allow today, 31st, would be a day that we commemorate, that we celebrate the day of Pentecost. And um, some may ask, what is the day of Pentecost? It's the day that the church celebrates what happened in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the indwelling Holy Spirit was given to God's people. Look with me in Acts chapter 2, if you have a moment on your phones or your Bibles, look with me in Acts chapter 2. Very pivotal moment in church history, a very critical moment in, in the history of the church. It's our legacy. This is our legacy. This is our history in Acts chapter 2 as we read of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And look with me in Acts chapter 2 in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were a dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. One of the most important things in our church history is in Acts chapter 2, the day that we celebrate today, the day of Pentecost, is that the Spirit, the Spirit always was there, even in the Old Testament, you see the Holy Spirit was in at work. But this was when the Church of God was birthed. This is when the Holy Spirit in Himself came and dwelled upon the people of God. And now in that the Spirit is indwelling. Now as believers, now as the church, we have that Spirit. We have the indwelling Spirit in us as Christians and believers. We are been baptized at the day of our salvation. And if you're saved today, we have that Spirit that can give us wisdom, that can give us guidance from the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 26, listen to this, church. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you, listen to this, all things and bring you to remembrance whatsoever I said it to you. Though the day of Pentecost is a, one of the most pivotal points of church history. Now, as the Holy Spirit comes, the church has power. We're in a parking lot. We're in a, a drive in service. But the Spirit is indwelling. It's still as powerful as the day as we assemble. 
in church. And now, with all the, the chaos that is going, the world is searching for peace. The politicians are looking for peace. The church is trying to look for peace. But church, I want to give you some encouragement today. On the day of Pentecost, May 31st, in our history, I want to read a verse that will give us encouragement. In John 14, 27, a verse that we just read, a previous verse, a verse after that says this, Peace, this is Jesus speaking, I leave with you. May peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus himself, listen, he said, church, I am peace. I am peace, and I give it to you in that Holy Spirit that has been given to every Christian. We have peace. And not only that, verse 27 says, our heart should not be troubled. Listen, if you, we have a God that defeated the death, defeated death, defeated grave, he rose from the dead after three days and conquering the cross and giving us life. He tells us as Christians, we should not be troubled. With all the events going on, even in this city, in this town, in this world, in our state, I am not surprised, church. The world even says, in John 15, 18, God says that if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So church, the chaos that is going around us, it should not trouble our hearts or let us in fear. It should not because the Holy Spirit has given us a sound mind, a peace of power, because we've been given the peace of God. We've been given the peace of Jesus Christ. And yes, our world is in chaos. That's because they don't know Jesus. The world is in chaos because they don't know who Jesus is. Because if they had Jesus, we wouldn't go out and protest. The Bible doesn't even tell us to protest anything. It tells us to love our neighbor. It tells us to love. Now I realize the Constitution allows people to protest, and I'm not even against that. They can do protest in peace. But the most perfect, the most important thing the church needs to do in response to what's going on today is to pray. The church has to pray. The church, more than any time that I have in my life, we have to pray even more today. Because the city is looking for peace. They're looking for something to grab a hold of, and they can't find it. But we as a church, we know. We know what peace is because we have the peace that's inside. And in Acts chapter 2, the day that we're celebrating Pentecost, we celebrate today that we have a God that we can go to because He has peace. In the middle of our, tri our trials, in the middle of a chaos, a city who is going into chaos, and we, they have uh, placed a curfew last night, they're going to do today, our hearts should not be troubled because we serve the King of Kings who has given us peace. So church, I want to lead us into prayer right now. Brother John is going to preach a sermon today. But church, I want you to know, don't be worried. Don't be troubled. The solution to this chaos in our world and all these different events that are going on is Jesus Christ. The solution to our problems is God himself. And on the day of Pentecost, it's so appropriate for the church to pray. And church, I want to encourage all of you that we're going to start a church fast tomorrow, Monday through Saturday. Six days of fasting of the church, the Church of Rochester. Then we're going to pray for our city. We're going to pray for our church. Because church, don't forget that out of all this chaos, the church itself has been singled out. The church itself has been singled out. That we can't even go back into our building. But that's okay. They can continue to do that. Because we know that the world hates us. We know the world is not going to be favorable to us. And that's not shocking to me. So let's pray for our church. Let's pray for our city. Because the church's name is the Church of Rochester. So what happens in our city is very important to us. But the solution, the greatest solution, is prayer. And so church, I don't have a sign-up sheet. But pick a day this week. 
Monday through Saturday, six days, that the Church of Rochester is going to go into a church fast to pray for our nation, to pray for our city, to pray for the world, but also pray for our church, that we can meet again. We can meet together in a building. And I believe, church, it is so appropriate that to the day of Pentecost today, that we get to start a church fast as a response of the chaos. Because we need to promote this, that Jesus loves the world, and if they repent of their sins, they can get, receive Christ. If you have any chance this week to preach the gospel of Jesus, do it. But church, I want to end in prayer. But remember, tomorrow, Monday through Friday, we're going to start the Church of Rochester Church Fast, and we can pray for our city, pray for our church. Join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've given us this time to remember the day of Pentecost. To also start a church fast. The Church of Rochester, we're concerned what goes on in our city, in our town, and we want to help. The greatest way for us to help is Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would all hear, all who are present, that we would pray. That all of us here present know that prayer changes things. It changes the world. It changes people. Someone prayed for me and I got saved. I received Christ because of prayer. May we pray for our city. May we pray for this nation. May we pray for this world to know God, to repent of their sins, that there will be an awakening, Lord. And today at the day of Pentecost, it is so appropriate that we start a church fast. It is appropriate that we look to you and thank you for this indwelling Holy Spirit. Because without the Spirit, we can't do anything. I pray for a specific protection over this city. That the protests will stop. These violent, evil acts and criminal things that are going on will stop in the name of Jesus. That you would provide peace to Rochester. You provide pre peace in the, the town of Greece. That you pro provide peace in New York State, in this world. That there wouldn't be even one protest. A violent protest again after this. May the Church of God, may the Church of Rochester fast this week. And I pray that you bless every single person who is going to be fasting this week. Monday through Saturday. Pray that we would lean to you, God, because we need you, Father. We need you in the name of Jesus Christ. We need you to affect our land and to heal our land. Because without your without prayer, without your indwelling Holy Spirit acting and giving us wisdom, there is no hope. But we know there's hope in Jesus. And I pray, Lord, as a church, we would come together. And we pray for our nation. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to see you all here parked in the parking lot and even the sound of your horns is a sweet melody which I enjoy hearing. Before when I would hear somebody honk their horn it really frustrated me and I got a little bit irritated but I think this time has forever changed my thinking about hearing a horn being honked. With that being said, keep the honking to a minimum and let's hear the word of God being preached. As you see, we are building our church. Last week it was just the stage. This week we have a wonderful set of stairs. Next week we will have walls around this stage and then probably we'll lay down the plumbing and electricity a little bit later. We are witnessing the building of our church. It's wonderful. On such an occasion as this, the Lord is growing our church. Of course it's a joke. I want to start off with a joke because the message, the message that I will be preaching this afternoon is of a more sober and serious nature. Today we will be continuing our series in the book of 1 Peter titled, Living Victoriously in a Troubled World. With each day that is passing our world, country, state, city is becoming more and more troubled. The news doesn't even have to inform us of this. We can just see it with our own eyes how our own city is in turmoil. Cars are burning, 
stores are being broken into. There's mere, there are military vehicles which are patrolling the streets. The last time I preached, I said, we are in need to learn how to live victoriously in a troubled world. Well, our need has grown even more. In the midst of everything that is taking place, in my personal life, my wife and I were expecting a child in the month of July. And when I stop and think about a baby, how helpless and needy a baby is, and that on its own, the baby will never be able to survive, not to mention survive in a time and day and age which we are living in. I just stop and think about children, babies. They're not capable to handle this life on their own. They need parents, they need help, because they are not mature. They have not grown up to adulthood that they can manage on their own. And in our generation, there's a new phenomenon that is taking place. Grown-ups are acting like little children. Physically, they are mature, but mentally and emotionally speaking, they are childish. This phenomenon that I'm referring to is called the millennial generation. Now, if you're a parent, you might have one of these living in your house. And I feel sorry for you and pray that the Lord helps us mature. And it's obvious when adults act childish and in a childish manner that that's a problem. But for some reason when we apply the same reason to our spiritual life, we are not as alarmed. And we say things like, everybody grows up at their own pace, just give them a break and so on. Now, I agree with that to a certain extent. I'm not going to force my one-year-old daughter to change her own diaper and fix herself a meal. That's unreasonable. I'm not some sort of tyrant. However, when she is older and grows up a little bit, I am expecting her to take care of herself. Now, the same concept applies to our spiritual life. When we are babes in Christ, no one is expecting us to move mountains. But when we have been Christian for 10 years or even more and there is no sign of growth and we are still wearing a spiritual diaper if you will that is a serious problem that is alarming and we should be taking notice of our condition if we are in that one now maybe these spiritual millennials and if you find yourself in this condition and you are finally tired of acting immature and freeloading, this message is for you. The message today is titled, Do You Want to Grow? It's a question. Do you have a desire to grow spiritually? Now, before we get into our message, I want to give us some really good news. I know that was maybe difficult to listen to, but you don't have to wish and hope to grow spiritually. Now, I remember when I was ministering in California, we would gather together for a nightly prayer. And before we play, prayed, we would go around in a circle and share our needs, what we had, what we wanted God to accomplish in our life. And one of the needs that I frequently heard was the brothers would always say, we want spiritual growth. Now, when I heard this, it frustrated me because we would always teach them that if you want to grow, you don't have to wish and just pray for some sort of miracle to happen and that you will overnight spiritually grow. Just do what the Bible says and desire the milk of the word that you were, that you may grow thereby. If we want to grow spiritually, this is not a wish or a miracle by some act of God that will happen if he shows us grace. This is in our ability to accomplish if we so desire. If we are tired of acting childishly and immature and carnally and fleshly, well, dear brother and sister, the ones who are sitting in your cars, I have great news. You can accomplish this because when we obey the Word of God, the Word of God is true, the promises of God are true, and it will be accomplished in our life when we desire the Word 
we will grow thereby. The Apostle Peter gives us instructions in spiritual growth. And our text today will be 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. And I would like to read them for us. Verse 1, Wherefore laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Every Christian should want to grow. Every Christian should want more of God, more of His love, grace, mercy, power, and so on. Now the key word is every Christian should want all of this. We are God's children, therefore we should desire God more. That's just common sense. Our desire is not birth because we are so noble and wonderful, but it is birth out of our new birth. When we are born again, we receive a new nature which craves the things of God for fellowship with our Heavenly Father, for communion with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit in the Christian cries out, Abba Father. It's giving evidence of the longing and the desire and the need that we have for our Heavenly Father. Friends, moreover, we do not only should be wanting God, but we need God. Jesus said in John chapter 15 verse 5, For without me you can do nothing. Let that sink in for us. Without Jesus Christ, we can do absolutely nothing. We need God. That's our only option. This is the only solution to any of our problems that we have in life. We should not be looking for other options and other solutions. As Pastor David said, Jesus Christ will give us victory. He will the one who will give us peace and comfort. We need look no further. We desire God because we need Him. What arises out of our desires or want and need for God is a lifelong pursuit of God. Our new nature compels us to pursue after God, to desire the things of God. This is a result of being born again. We want to know and to love and please our Heavenly Father more and more. And the more we know God, the more we learn about God, our desires grow even greater. A goal for each and every single Christian should be as it is written in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, to grow in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the fullness of Christ. A goal should be to grow unto the measure of the fullness of Christ. So we understand, dear friends, that a desire to want more of God and the realization of your need of God is in fact a reliable indicator that you are a child of God and that is something that is good for us to understand. It is evidence of our regeneration. Now, with all of that being said, unfortunately that description that I just stated does not characterize many professing Christians. Many do not have a desire or a need of God. And I find that extremely troubling. Dear friends, I think we should all agree that that is a problem that is plaguing the Church of Christ. Today's message will give us a lesson on what we can do and something that we can resolve in our own personal life if we find ourselves in a condition of complacency and no desire for God and no desire to need God. And before we get into that, I want to illustrate several conditions for us that many professing believers find themselves in. I've spoken with a number of people. This is not just something that I have came up with out of the blue. I personally have met Christians who are in these conditions. And if we are even honest with ourselves, because nobody's seeing you right now, you're in your car, so I believe you can be honest, you can really understand and maybe remember how 
There was a time in your life maybe that you even slipped into one of these conditions yourself. The first condition is describes people who say they want more of God. Now, have you ever met any one of those people? They just say they want more of God. And when you hear them express their desires and their passions after God, you become ashamed of your lack of passion. You look at these people who speak of their wonderful desires and you cower because you do not have the same desires. This group, however, despite their profession, the actions that follow are the true indicator of where their desires and passions lie. This type of group of people are all talk. I want to give you an example. I was, after a youth service, we went out to go have dinner with some youth members and there was someone who was out of town, so we invited them as well and I'm sitting there interrogating, I mean, asking him questions. And I ask him, what do you want to do? And for about 30 seconds, he says how he wants to be a missionary. And this lasted for about 30 seconds. And then for the remainder of the time which he was speaking, which was about 20 minutes, he really shared what his desires were. It was just all talk. The true desires of his heart began to flow like a living waters, as Jesus said. The desires to have a family, to have a career, to buy a car. No, that's not bad and wrong. But we have to be honest with ourselves. The second condition that people find themselves in are people who are content with how much they know God. They feel like they know God enough. They don't have any greater desire to learn anything other about God. They have enough. I mean, come on, they go to church, they read and pray sometimes, and they feel like that's plenty. The taste has become so common, so familiar, that it has lost its savior. They just want something new, something different. God has become familiar and common. And that just brings up a point that we as Christians, dear friends, should never be content with how much we know our God, with how much we know our Savior. Our desires should never be quenched in our pursuit after God. And the third condition, and this is probably the most critical one, these group of people don't care about God at all. Maybe they came and said a prayer and they allowed Christ into their lives, as people say, and that's the end. The Christian chapter of their life is over. Now they can just go and do their own thing. Like some of the youth I hear nowadays say, they're just doing me. This group is only concerned about living the best they can on earth, seeking after worldly treasures and pleasures. And that's terrible. Now, these three conditions, and perhaps there are more, I've described these individuals that are spiritually sick. I want us to catch that. These groups of people that I have described are spiritually sick, or even in the worst case, they're spiritually dead. We don't want to find ourselves in any of these categories, and God forbid, of course. And I would like to add that what's even more tragic is that these conditions describe a majority of today's church. A majority of today's church can be found in these three conditions. A great number of professing Christians do not care about growing in their faith, becoming mature believers. There's no desire to become more and more like the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Maybe you're sitting in your cars and you're listening to what I'm saying and you're saying to yourself, John, I think you're overreacting a bit. This is a bit of a stretch to say that the majority of church is in this condition. And I would only answer you by pointing to the evidence which is as clear as day, and that's the church itself. Much of the church looks exactly like the world. The only difference is that Christians nowadays say they believe in Jesus, and that's all. They just say they believe in Jesus. 
There is no evidence or fruit of their regeneration. No new life. No holy living. No obedience to God. No love one for another with a pure heart. As it's written in the first chapter of 1 Peter, which we have studied. Friends, I want us to understand that that first chapter describes a real Christian. Not a superstar Christian. Just a standard issue born again believer. Holy living, obedience to God, love for God, and love for one another. Now, I want to make something clear. I'm not saying that we're all perfect. At times we make mistakes, we falter. However, generally speaking, that's a description of a true Christian. Instead, what we see from Christians today is the opposite the complete opposite of what we have read about in 1 Peter. We see people who aren't worried about holy living. They say Jesus accepts you as you are. You don't have to repent. You don't have to feel sorry for your sin. You don't have to change your life. And this is the type of preaching that many people are listening to. When you talk about obedience to God, you get labeled as a legalist. People point the finger criticize you you don't have to take up your cross in today's Christianity you don't have to sacrifice you don't have to follow Jesus you're under grace buddy it's gonna be okay and loving one another has become such a superficial term it's been thrown around so loosely that even when the world observes the church they see the hypocrisy citing all the division and problems that are existing amongst so-called brothers and sisters. If you ask me, we closely resemble the Laodicean church that's found in chapter 3 of the book of Revelations. We say we're rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing, but in reality, we're wretched and miserable, poor and naked. All of this, these conditions, is fruit or evidence that Christians have lost their desire to grow closer to God. This is fruit of immaturity in the church. The passion that fuels the pursuit of God has been extinguished by carnality. But dear friends, that was definitely a lot to listen to and sobering, but I have wonderful news. This is not the end. The book has not closed yet. To that same church of Laodicea in chapter 3 were written the following words. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Repentance is something that has become so unpopular in today's church. But dear brother and sister, if you are feeling convicted, that's the Lord Jesus giving you His grace right now in this moment to make a change in your life. We can do something about our lack of desire and need for God. By the grace of God, we have been given these days which we are gathering in these parking lots and listening to church on law to prepare ourselves for our encounter with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you the question again. Do you want to grow? Do you have a desire? Maybe if you didn't, after all I've said these past three or four minutes, maybe you have a desire now. And that's wonderful. And before we go into how to accomplish that, I want to say that the desire for God's Word, the desire to follow after God is an indicator, and it's a wonderful one, of someone who is truly saved. When a person is born again, they receive a new nature, as we touched on earlier. And this new nature has cravings, new desires, as Peter said in verse 2, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. In other words, if we stay the same, it's a problem. We are commanded 
to grow. And as Paul even put it in Ephesians, to grow unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When a person is born both spiritually and physically, a sign that they are healthy is that they grow. If one is to grow, they must eat something that the nutrients may provide some sort of needed energy for the growth to take place. But before we eat, our appetite or desire to consume the food which produces the act, which provides the energy for the growth has to be present. We have to have an appetite or a desire. This simple concept represents a person that is spiritually healthy if they have a desire. They desire the milk of the word, the spiritual food, that they may grow and be fruitful for the kingdom of God. I want to step into the context that the Apostle Peter was writing in. The believers were enduring extreme persecution on the doorstep of one of the most severe persecutions that have ever been recorded in church history. And what was being instructed of the Apostle Peter to that church was that they should be strong and mature. They are to live a holy life. They are to be obedient to God. They are still to love one another in the midst of all of this. If they were to accomplish this, dear friends, they had to be mature. They had to be grown-ups. That kind of Christianity, it not only honors God, but also displays the power of God. That He is enabling the Christian to persevere in such difficult and harsh circumstances to preserve somebody in a holy state obedience to God with love for God and one another that displays the power of God in the believer my dear friend the same applies to us as well we are living in challenging times our faith is being tested through this pandemic through the chaos that has developed over the recent days every believer is in a spiritual batter whether they are aware of it or not and if we are not only those who receive the letter of first Peter but if we are to fulfill what Peter has left for the church we must be mature Christians we have to act and be grown-ups brother and sisters we do not should only want to grow but we need to grow. We need to be mature believers. Now the Apostle Peter, I thank God that the Word of God just instructs us very clearly and plainly, tells us how to accomplish this, how to accomplish spiritual growth in our lives. We must desire the Word of God. That's a very simple and practical bit of advice that the Apostle has given us. And I'm going to give us two practical steps, very simple and easy to understand, steps that if we are to take, we will have a desire for the Word of God. Dear friend, if you are sitting in your car and you haven't opened up your Bible in a week or two or a month, these steps will help you in developing a desire for the Word of God. We don't have to go into deep exegesis of this passage of Scripture. It's plain and simple for us to understand. Before we desire the Word of God, Peter tells us to do something. And this is the first step. Remember how powerful the Word of God has been in your life already. Verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and evil speakings. He begins the second chapter with a wherefore. He's, he's going back to what was written in the first chapter in verses 20 and down. He says, remember everything that God has done for you in your life. And as a result of the word of God, you have been born again. Written in chapter 1 verse 23. Peter is saying, remember. Remember how powerful the word of God has already been in your life. That incorruptible 
gospel seed, the word of God, the gospel message has produced in you a new birth. No, forget that. Remember how powerful this word has been in your life. Friends, this is the greatest miracle that has ever happened and will ever happen to you. You have been born again. And sometimes we forget that. And being Christians for a number of years, we get used to hearing things like you are born again. And you have God, the Holy Spirit, living inside of you. And they become familiar in common terms. Dear friend, the only reason they become familiar and common is that we have become content with God. And this contentment is a result of lack of growth. The more you know God, the more you grow in the knowledge of God, the greater the desire becomes to follow Him. It's always new, it's always changing. You'll never get boring, you'll never get dull. This is the almighty eternal God which we claim to love and worship and serve. Dear friend, if you only had a desire, if you only had the thirst to seek after Him, those words, those thoughts, you would never entertain ever because you understand how good and gracious God truly is. The first step to developing this desire after God is to remember what He has done in your life. Remember the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, how the Son of God came from the glory of heaven and died for us, atoning for our sins, giving us an opportunity to spend eternity with God. This is the most wonderful message that we will ever hear in our lives. God forbid it becomes dull. God forbid it becomes something common. I want to encourage us. Meditate on these things as the scripture calls. Think on these things, especially in these difficult times where we need to be mature, where we must be strong. Let those past experiences, the wonderful times that you've spent with God, dictate your future choices that you make. The Word of God is powerful. It has worked, and it will continue to work. You don't fix something if it's not broken. Oh, no move on to the second step that we are to take if this desire is present in our lives or if it is to be present in our lives. The Apostle Peter calls us to lay aside all sin. Now I'm not going to go into the description of the sins that were uh, that were listed in the, in the first verse but we are to understand that believers who are practicing these sins the result of it will be a hindered desire for the Word of God. We as Christians are called and we should strive to eradicate the sin from our life. This is our duty. If we have these sins which have been listed, the malice, the lying, the hypocrisy, the envy, this should sound an alarm in our head because if this exists in our life, the desire doesn't. We as Christians must strive to eradicate the sin in our life. If we are involved in any of these, there is still time, dear friends, to replace this sin with a desire for the Word of God. Now I want us to catch what Peter says. Lay aside. This is a command to his readers to get rid of the sin in their lives. The idea was referring to someone taking off dirty clothes. They were taking something off and putting on something that was pure and clean. Peter was reminding his readers that they needed to grow. And what provided the growth was the Word of God. And if they were to desire the Word of God, they needed to lay aside all sin. Now it's important for us to understand that this order of steps cannot be skipped. The first leads to the second. And I also want to point out that this requires our 
cooperation. The Holy Spirit, as I often say, will not do everything for you. Now many of you might be shocked, but I pray that we understand and not have a sense of entitlement, if you will, not be these spiritual millennials. And just because we are God's children, to expect that everything will be done for us and we will sit back and enjoy the ride. We are called to lay aside all these sins, and that is a manual operation. No one else can do it for you. No one else is going to come and lay that aside. That is our role that we play in our sanctification and becoming more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another thing I want to point out is these steps are not complicated, and that's very good. At times we we like to over-spiritualize things and make things more difficult than they have to be. We think that if it's more complicated, then it will be better and more effective. But that's not true. It's very simple and easy to understand. And if followed, it will work in our life. The Lord Jesus Christ has already done for us that which we could never accomplish, that which we could never do on our own. He has atoned for our sins. He has paid the price. And by His death, we have eternal life. If we believe in Him, we will be born again. And that's all the doing of the Lord. What is left for us is to simply obey what He has done for us in His Word. That's all. If the Word says, remember what God has done for you, well then we remember it. If it says, lay aside all sin, then we lay it aside. Those are simple, easy, practical steps that we have to take. We don't have to look for any secret knowledge or some sort of deep mystery to rid ourselves. The book of 1 Peter in black and white tells us very simply what we should be doing. Verse 2, as newborn babies desire the murk of the word that you may grow. Now if these two steps are followed, our desire will not be hindered. The desire will be there because we are not filling our life with the junk, the sin that Apostle Peter tells us to rid ourselves with. We remember what God has done. And because of His great power, we want more of God and we lay aside anything that will prohibit growth in our life, that will quench our spiritual maturity. Peter provides for us an illustration here as newborn babies desiring milk. This is the desire that we are to have for the Word of God. A baby desires milk, and I was thinking about this, not because it tastes good, I don't even know if it knows what it tastes like, but because it's the only thing the baby can eat at that point in its life, it cannot process any other type of food. Our spiritual growth depends on the Word of God as much as that baby depends on its mother's milk. I don't want to even add anything to that. I don't want to bring a different analogy that will uh, make this clear because that's the most simple and clear analogy that we can think about. A baby, if it doesn't have milk, it will die. It can't eat anything else. Dear friend, this is exactly what the Bible, what Apostle Peter is writing to the believers. Just like those children who are born, their desire for milk should mirror ours for the Word of God if we are to grow. Verse 3, Peter quotes Psalm 34. Peter begins with a conditional. If, since you have tasted, since you have been born again, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, 8. You have been converted. You have been born again. You already know how wonderful God is. Like that baby, the milk is the only acceptable source of food. It does not want anything else. When we taste and see that the Lord is gracious, truly taste, we will not want anything else. I remember when I was a hypocrite, and a phony Christian, it was so difficult for me to want to go to church. It was so difficult for me to have a desire for the Word of God. If somebody asked me to pray, it was almost committing an act of torture on me. That's how much I did 
dislike Christianity, although I profess it. But dear friend, once the Lord did an amazing work in my life, gave me a new birth. Out of that new birth, desired a new appetite, a new craving. I am a Christian, dear friend, not out of duty and out of burden, but this is what's in my heart. And I'm nothing special. I'm not better than anything else and than anyone else, excuse me. This is just a result of being born again. This is a result of having a new nature. I desire God. I want to know God. Why? Because He is good. Because with God, it's better than anything that this world can ever offer. It's not a difficult trade-off for me. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is gracious. In concluding, I just want to leave us with a few words. In the day that we are living in, dear friends, we need God more than ever. As David said, in my lifetime, I have never lived through such serious circumstances. The things that are taking place in the world today require a mature faith. If we are to remain faithful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if we are to endure all the chaos that is surrounding us, we must be mature. I don't have to convince you even of the severity of what's taking place. We see it for ourselves. I want to change the question that I began with by making it into a statement. Not do you want to grow, but we must grow. Today we see widespread fear and panic that's happening in the world and in the churches as well. And the only reason this is happening in the church is that because believers are not mature when they ought to be, they haven't grown up. My beloved friends, I truly mean that. If we are to find yourself in these conditions that were previously mentioned, a fear, panic, that's filled your heart, there is a solution. I wasn't saying all of these things to just patronize us and point the finger, rather that we may understand that for the Christian, it does not and should not be the same as what the world is experiencing. In Christ, there is victory. In Christ, there is peace throughout all circumstances and situations in life. Friends, with all everything that's taking place, fear of getting sick, the civil unrest, the global instability, what shall we say to these things? As it's written in Romans, if God be for us, who can be against us? No matter what is happening, what shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? No matter what the enemy throws at us to try to defeat us, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Praise the Lord. Wanting to grow is not difficult. When you're doing what the Word of God says, the desire, the appetite, that's just the result of the obedience. That's just the result of you doing what the Word of God says. Dear friend, this is wonderful news. It may have been hard to listen. Maybe it was in a more rebuking fashion and manner. But I truly believe that this message is necessary for the time that we are living in. If you don't have a desire, remember the two steps. Remember what God has already done in your life and lay aside the sin and the desire will be there for the Word of God and we will grow up to be mature Christians, able to honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ even in the midst of all this chaos and difficulty that we are currently in. We will remain faithful. We will not be moved because our faith, our life is founded on the rock which is Jesus Christ. I want to pray with us this afternoon and ask the Lord to help us to understand this truth in a more clear and vivid way than we have ever understood it before. 
that we may obey the word of God and see the wonderful results that it has promised. Father, I thank you for your word which so wonderfully and clearly instructs us. Lord God, we are in desperate need that we may grow and be mature believers, Father, that we may honor you and worship you with our life because you have given us a precious salvation. And we must walk worthy with the calling which we have been called with. As well, Father, we need to be mature to endure everything that is taking place around us. It's not easy. It's a lot of chaos, a lot of uncertainty. Father, and we are in need of your strength more than ever. May this be accomplished in your church. May we grow. May we become mature. May we become more filled with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. May we grow into the stature of the measure of Christ as it's written in your word. That all of this may result in your glory because you are worthy of it all. Father, I pray that you may bless each and every single person that is come here and has listened to the word.